Welcome to the Darius Gantt Show. I'm your host, Darius Gantt, as well as founder and CEO of Tesoro AI, where we help innovative companies scale both AI solutions and AI teams. On this podcast, we focus on cutting edge technology, more specifically, artificial intelligence. By getting up close and personal with visionary AI founders and executives, we get to learn more about the real life use cases, the real life problems that AI is solving. And we learn what steps these innovative founders are taking to build their business. In this episode, we speak with Brian Matthews, CTO, and Abhishek Pani, CPO of a company by the name of Bright Machines. Bright Machines is applying computer vision, cloud computing, and adaptive robotics to the world of manufacturing. More specifically, product assembly and inspection. Not only will you find it interesting our discussion regarding manufacturing and AI, we'll also dive a little bit more into synthetic data. We're always talking about data as it relates to AI, it's so important. This time we'll talk about a new way of generating data, training your models, leveraging synthetic data. Both of our guests come from larger companies, which you've probably heard of, Autodesk and Adobe. So they'll be shelling out a lot of gems that you'll be able to take away from today. Don't feel bad about hitting the rewind button if there's something that you didn't catch and you want to pick up on. If you yourself are considering building an AI solution or scaling up your AI team, feel free to reach out to the folks here at Tesoro AI. We've assembled the top experts in data science and machine learning. So whether you need AI strategy, data labeling, custom software development, or staff augmentation help, you have a team, a strong team here that has your back. So head over to www.tesoroai.com. All right, folks, let's hop into the show and hear from Brian and Abhishek. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we are joined by the team at Bright Machines. Joining us will be Brian Matthews, who is the CTO of Bright Machines, and Abhishek Pani, who leads the artificial intelligence efforts. Before we hop in and start digging into the details about the business, I would love, because we have two of you today, would love for you guys to just give a bit of a background for yourself, and then we'll start learning more about the, 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 the company itself. So Brian, if you wouldn't mind hopping in and kicking us off. Uh, sure. I have been in the high-tech in industry for far too many years, but spent 25 at Autodesk where I was involved with computer-aided design, CAD, computer graphics, and then the inverse of that, computer vision. So graphics is when you're going from uh, geometry and a model in 3D and trying to get pixels. And then, of course, uh, computer visions, where there's a lot of machine learning going the other way around, uh, trying to get back into a model. Uh, did some simulation and then uh, finished up with a lot of cloud computing, ran uh, 20,000 servers and was head of the platform group at Autodesk, uh, where we did a tremendous amount of simulation and stuff and then brought that all here to Bright Machines. Awesome, awesome. So, so you had some relevant background. First of all, Autodesk, I'm sure most folks have, have heard of that, but then you were able to get some experience in AI and, and, and were able to bring that over to Bright Machines. Abby, would love to hear a little bit more about your background as well. Uh, sure, I've spent more than a decade and a half in Silicon Valley. Before that, I was doing my PhD in applied math. And there, this was before the time when ML became popular. So I was doing my <laughs> in optimization and statistics uh, and game theory. And suddenly ML takes off. I was working in Silicon Valley in a company where we were applying a lot of those methods. This was in a completely different space. This was programmatic online bidding for advertising purposes. But Many of those methods, high dimensional statistical models, optimization algorithms, all of them really translate to many other domains. And if you look at the manufacturing sector, uh, there are very direct applications of those methods. So I worked at a startup. Uh, we, uh, the startup got acquired by Adobe. I was there for a few years. I was running AI research, engineering and product for parts of Adobe's AI ML efforts, and then uh, saw the opportunity how AI ML can be truly transformative for manufacturing and decided to take the leap and join Brian uh, in this journey. Okay, so Brian, talk you into joining the journey, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, Brian and Amar, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get in more, we're gonna get into more of that soon here, right? Because I think it's really interesting, especially for startups, right? You, you're always taking this risk. So one, you 
need a certain type of personality when you're trying to recruit folks into uh, the startups. But two, presumably, folks who are of the talent level of Abhishek have other opportunities. So what are the things, Abhi, will ask you kind of that, that really drew you over to, to Bright Machines? And then we'll have a chat with Brian about what he thinks <laughs> as well. <laughs> they may be different. Brian would love to learn more about kicking off Bright Machines, kind of the idea. What was the genesis of the idea? Was there a pain point you saw in the market where you said, look, our solution is where we need to take this. And maybe there were some pivots in there uh, as well. So we'd love to learn more about that. Yeah. It's interesting because at university, I studied electrical engineering and I ended up at Bright Machines where the, the company is really focused on manufacturing. And mm -hmm. we have a specialty in electronics manufacturing, but we do other types as well. But if you look at the manufacturing industry, the last major innovation that's happened has been globalization. This idea that you offshore everything offshore mm -hmm. jobs and the manufacturing and so on. And so there's uh, your iPhone and all that stuff. There's an army of people that are manually making these things. But after many decades of globalization, a couple of things have changed. Number one, nobody's making new countries to offshore to. There isn't another planet <laughs> to go to. So there just isn't that same highly available and cheap workforce that you can offshore to. But second is globalization actually works. There's about 350,000 people that are joining the middle class every day. And it's because globalization brought money to the parts of the world where there wasn't any. And over many, many decades, very slowly, education has improved, uh, economics have improved. And so now people don't want those jobs anymore. In fact, uh, some of the plants where we work, there is a 15 to 25% turnover rate, but that's not per year. That's per month. Wow. And so just in the electronics manufacturing industry, there's about 300,000 300, people who are going to quit their job this month. And so if you want to keep your factories running, you got to hire that many every month. But then if you look at the auto industry for electrification of cars, they're looking in the next five years with self-driving and, and assist features and stuff of tripling the amount of electronics just in autos. So you've got this crunch where demand is going up, the labor supply is going down, and then you can't have employees next to each other anymore. And then you throw tariffs into this and the trade wars that are happening, and now offshoring becomes really expensive. So you want to do your production close to where consumption happens in the same country. But your labor rates in high-cost countries makes it hard. And so the only answer is automation. And so that's really the foundation of this company mm -hmm. is that we need to automate things that have never been automated before. When you watch the news, you've seen robots run auto factories for 30 years, but there's a lot of things that have never been automated to this date. And we can talk about where machine learning comes in and why they haven't been automated is the real question and what we think we can do different. Yeah, love that insight. Would love to get some more insight into Bright Machines itself. So maybe some some use cases could really drive home for us how you all are actually implementing your, your product. Uh, and I believe you guys are hardware and software, but your product into uh, the customer's facilities or whatever it may be. Sure. I think to answer that question, first and foremost, one needs to realize that automation is not new. It has existed. It's just that the footprint of automation has not been what it should have been, right? And there have been fundamental challenges in the type of automation which has existed in manufacturing. So first and foremost, automation solutions have been very custom, right? So you figure out the product that you want to assemble, you design a custom solution for that. The flip side is the deployment times are long, when you try mm -hmm. to relocate your automation solutions, it is not easy. The knowledge transfer and the software, they don't really transfer well across locations. You can't reuse the equipment and software if your products change. So that's one, one issue of your custom solution. The other thing is, unlike software, you haven't had really these integration frameworks where the hardware can easily come together and you have a right. software, <laughs> software abstraction layer which can just work on top of that, right? And it's been a function of business models also for many of these companies, but sometimes uh, it's also the lack of advancement of software in manufacturing as a sector. Plus, the automation solutions have been more hardware-driven than software-driven. So the, the amount of software 
which goes with the automation solution is typically the minimal software required to make the automation solution work and not the software that is needed to make it right. uh, successful over time, right? And the ability to scale up or scale down your automation solution also doesn't really exist. So you have to have a good estimate of the demand, you build the automation mm -hmm. solution, and then that's what you assume will, will uh, stand the test of time. So all of this combined with the fact that if you do not have a mature product design, you do not have long life cycle for the product itself, the cost of the product is not high enough, right? Or the volume is not high enough, you would not think about automation, right? So what we are trying to do is saying, hey, can we, given the advancements which have happened on the software side, given the advancements which, have, which are happening on cloud computing and edge computing, the advancements which are happening in AI ML, can we actually create a platform which will address all these concerns? And to the point you're making, Darius, for the, hardware plus software stack, we are creating the software platform, but we are building it for a specific reference architecture, which will help us penetrate the uh, market initially while expanding the footprint of our software to include other, other third-party systems as part of our ecosystem. So I think that's where we are, and these are the classes of challenges we are addressing for discrete manufacturing specifically. Yeah, and one way to, that we like to put it is, if you think of the thing that's the most man, manual process step in, in manufacturing, building something, the most manual step is deploying automation systems. Mm -hmm. If you, Getting automatically made th things is the very most manual step that you will do. So designing those systems, deploying them, calibrating them and so on is incredibly manual. There's not enough software there. So that's what we're doing. Imagine what software did to cars with uh, Tesla and SpaceX and, and the iPhones right. and so on. And in this industry, because the company's traditionally been hardware companies, the software was the afterthought. And I think mm -hmm. just like Tesla inverted that, SpaceX inverted that, let's start with the software and, and make the hardware built around software control. And one of the reasons why people haven't done that in the past is because without uh, machine learning and AI and computer vision and so on, without those techniques, there's too much customization to have that work. And that's what's changed. And that's why we founded this company at this moment. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong here about the industry, but the reason it was not working is when you think about having to customize a solution for each new client, right? That takes a lot of man hours. And that will quickly bring your margins razor thin. So if for every new customer, you have to bring in a service team to implement new custom software for that individual. At some point, it just doesn't make sense because there's no real ability to scale your solution or at least provide it at a price point where customers are, are willing to pay for it and see some ROI on their end. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, the, the gross margins are low but uh, you also have long lead time items in the supply chain, right? So if every project is bespoke, you have to manage your supply chain. So there is a gross margin problem. There is just the time it takes to do the automation. But once you get the hardware in place, because of the lack of common software frameworks and platform, the time it takes to also set up the hardware to do the automation that you care about. So all of them are broken to a certain extent. And what we are trying to do is if we can standardize on some hardware building blocks. If we can standardize the interface between the hardware components, create that abstraction layer where we can then have software do all the logic and have less of that logic embedded in the hardware, we feel we can reduce both the deployment times of automation solutions significantly and to, to the point you're making, Darius, get a higher ROI by reducing the cost of deployment too. Yeah, and where have you seen this movie before? It's really the software industry and cloud computing. I mean, think of uh, reservation systems for airlines 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago before the yeah. public cloud. The way you would run a data center, only the biggest companies could do it, highly manual and deploying it. And all the equipment was very custom, custom databases, custom interfaces. And now everything is automated. And so that's what we're doing. We're automating automation, automating the design, automating the deployment, automating the calibration. We're automating the deployment of automation systems. Okay, very helpful. And and so to get back to, because I, I really want to make this more, more concrete and we can have more of a mental picture of the actual technology, the actual products that customers are, are working with. 
what does that what does it actually look like? What are the products that you are are using with customers? Sure, we have a whole number. P pretty much, we will build anything that's about a meter by a meter by a meter. But to give okay. you some examples <laughs> of some of our customers, we've got one customer that is in the medical industry, and they have a test kit. So you do a swab, and you put your stuff in there, and you don't want people to touch it. These robots will take those test kits apart, do all the reactants and stuff, and, and that's one. We have another company that does like a smoke alarm and fire alarm and security system control panels. We have another customer that's in the automotive industry, and these are the, the computers that allow you to do the self-driving cars and all that stuff. Those things are multi-layer uh, solutions that have cooling and all sorts of uh, wires and stuff. They have to be watertight. And that's another type of customer. We have a customer that's a consumer electronics company. They have a machine that makes your beverage every morning. And we can't, mm -hmm. uh, some of these customers, we're their strategic advantage. So we can't talk specifics about which products. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm being, I'm being general. And we have okay. other customers that, uh, some very large customers that build servers and, and communications equipment and things like that. So it's really, it doesn't matter what the thing is. It's more about the process where you want to mm -hmm. label something, you want to glue something together, you want to screw something, you want to weld it, you want to solder it. We have a, a headphone manufacturer that makes your headphones and so on. There are the applications of the products we are building, but there is the other side, which is what are we doing on the software and the AI ML side? to be able to build those products. And uh, for that, there is, I would just classify them into a few buckets. Like first is improving the machines that do the assembly itself, right? So whether it is the path planning for the robots, whether it is guidance of the robots, whether it is calibration of the robots, that's one set. Then it's ease of use of the software itself that is used for, for coding up the automation processes. So in that context, mm. the declarative approach to uh, doing the programming, ability to use simulation tightly with the development environment, those are the kind of advances. The third area is around visual inspection. So that is for quality as well as guidance. The fourth area would be like on the process itself. So there is the deployment, but after you deploy, the line runs for a few years, right? So in that context, doing insights and root cause analysis when something goes wrong. Why did something go wrong? And you don't really have the ability to do experiments. You have observational data, you still need to uh, reach inference. And the last part is you set up processes in a way to do what they're supposed to do, but you will have deviations over time, whether it is because of the equipment itself, whether it's because of the material or other reasons, right? And having automated way ways to look at the time series data and do anomaly detection, ability to flag that for services, all those things are part of our platform. So all the products that Brian described, we are using the technologies to be able to successfully deploy solutions that can assemble, but not just in, in the initial go, but over the lifespan of the product. Yeah, and just in hearing the number of different ways artificial intelligence, and so I think you listed four, right? A uh, number of different ways AI itself is being used. I mean, to me, it sounds like, look, you've got to deploy a ton of models <laughs> to, to make sure that this functionality works in the way. Is there some place where you all started and said, look, we're going to, and the reason I'm asking this question is because many folks, right, there, there are a ton of ways that you could use AI, but determining if you're in the enterprise, right, determining which application of AI you're going to use to kick off the business, that's another decision that that's going to be made. So among the tools that you have, the AI tools that you're having, is there a way that you decided, here's where we're going to start our, our AI journey. This is kind of the killer use case. What was that process like? Well, yeah, where you're not your average startup where you got couple of people in a garage or three or four people. I mean, we, we started this, our series A was around $200 million. So we had several hundred people in the company almost from the beginning. We were able to do multiple things in parallel in this space. So we okay. mentioned inspection. One of the things that was our first was if you think of the components, when you're making a circuit board and you're soldering the uh, various components onto that board, capacitors and resistors, some of those well, they're very, very small and they have to be put on very precisely. And there, there's a failure rate of that. The average mm -hmm. board might have 5% failure rate. 
or better, somewhere around there. It depends on what it is, how many components. And there's already, because a single board might have 10,000 components on it, you can't manually inspect these things. And you wanna find an error very early in the, in the production line because as you go down the line, you keep adding more and more value to it. At the end, you might get a car at the end. It's a, right. a very expensive car at that. So if there's a bug in this thing early on, you wanna catch it and not continue to add value to that broken one. So what we did was use machine learning around this where there's an already existing automated inspection to look at each of those little capacitors. Mm -hmm. And the way it was done wasn't with machine, it was very weak machine learning where people give a, a basic classifier is if the capacitor is there, it's this color. If it's not there, it's a different color. And it, they're manually tuned parameters. And it takes uh, dozens of hours to get one of these boards to even get tested in an automated way. But when you do, about 5% of the boards are gonna fail. And on human inspection, uh, something like 70 to 80% of those um, aren't actual failures. It's just that the automated system thinks they're a failure. There's a mm. shadow on the board or the lighting was a little weird and that throws it off. And so that's where we applied uh, some machine learning at first, doing a classifier. And in the end, we took what was about a 70% false positive rate with manual inspection. We got it better than a 1% false uh, positive rate. And we also found a out seven, that a lot of- 7% to 1% or 70 to 1%? Seven zero down oh, to wow. better, better than 1%, wow. you know, point, point oh. So, <laughs> so that, but the thing was, is we also found out that when humans had been reviewing the false positives, they are so bored with their job because mm. most all of them, 70 some percent of them are not actually failures. So they have to say, approve, approve, approve all day long. You, get muscle memory to hit that approve button. And so the uh, classifier found out that a lot of the labeled data was all wrong because the humans yeah. said bad things were good things. So that's that's one area, but we've, we've expanded from that. We're doing all sorts of inspection, uh, people returning products, and we have to find out if all the components are there or what's missing from a product uh, when people do product returns uh, so that we can disassemble them and reassemble them. Um, looking for outlier analysis when you go through various testing, and there's lots of sensors. We have we measure pressures and temperatures and torques, and so we can look for outlier analysis on any of these things. And then there's a lot that we're doing around computer vision, but we could talk about that mm -hmm. later. Just to add to Brian's point, there are all these problems, but the important thing there is, is to understand, like there is machine learning and then there is machine learning in a vertical, like manufacturing, right? Mm -hmm. In many cases, machine learning assumes you have a lot of data. So the part of, so if I divide into three blocks, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning, the ones that we typically see are supervised learning applications of machine learning, right? So right. you have labeled data, you are trying to apply machine learning to label data. The reality is in manufacturing, many times that labeled data just doesn't exist. So the example that Brian was pointing out on the written supply chain, trying to sort items through visual inspection, right? Uh, nobody really has labeled the data. So if you haven't labeled the data, how do you start with supervised learning? And that's where that example, even the other visual inspection one, the amount of labeled data many times is not sufficient, either doesn't right. exist or is not sufficient to switch learning. And in this case, getting people who understand CAD, getting people who understand materials, getting people who understand how to simulate makes it a, pro a way of actually leveraging machine learning by understanding the constraints of the processes that we are in and of the data, but either using synthetic data to be able to train our pipelines or being able to use transfer learning models to train our pipelines. So you have to go with a bunch of approaches, which if I were to look at the regular world where you had an ImageNet database, a lot of the deep learning models were trained on that and hence labeling pictures becomes easy. That's not true for manufacturing. There is a domain right. context here and we have to be uh, cognizant of the constraints imposed by the context so that we can apply machine learning the right way. And that I think is a challenge we are solving. So it's not just about taking machine learning pipelines off the shelf and putting the data in and that, uh, voila, you have an answer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's a thing that we talk to our customers a lot about. They get very excited that they're starting up a machine learning project in, inside <laughs> their company and they've got some product like this mouse. And I point out, I said, well, 
on the last day of production, your machine learning system will be ready to take over. And that's the problem, right? You need it to work on day one on your first mouse, not on the last mouse on the last day of production after you've made a million of them. And so this is why I think this is really hard and why we've really centered our company around getting a lot of expertise from many different industries. To get that synthetic training data, you got to understand CAD because before you make the first mouse, all you have is a CAD file for that mouse. And that's, that's yeah. really what we're starting with. We're starting with something that isn't even real. And how do we train up a system without the actual parts? Yeah. And I think that conversation around synthetic data, you hear that a lot less often, but more now than before, for reason that you were mentioning, can, a lot of data does not exist for certain use cases. So it does, to your point, require uh, domain knowledge. I'm curious if that's something- And, and that many domains, like many. I mean, if I talked about CAD, but now you want to make synthetic images. Now all of a sudden you need material science people, you need computer graphics people, geometry people, right? Yeah. You need people who know what a BRDF function is. There's a bunch of stuff besides the machine learning stuff that comes into play. Mm -hmm. And to get that, that data, right? Are you, were you leveraging subject matter experts within the team internally? Did you reach out to folks and say, Hey, look, we, we want to bring you on on a part-time basis to, to help us build out this synthetic data set. What's, what does that process look like? So in many cases for us, it is, so we, within the team, we have about somewhere between 450 to 500 employees. So we have people mm -hmm. who have very strong background in manufacturing and manufacturing processes, right? Mm -hmm. So we are leveraging part of our team to uh, validate the data labeling process. Some of it is completely automated, right? So from the CAD file itself, the CAD file itself serves as a way of generating the Y, which is the label, depending okay. on the dimensions, mm -hmm. but it also serves as a way of creating the variability in X by changing parameters within the CAD file, right? There is a, a understanding of the domain. There is the variability we are doing with the baseline data availability. We also leverage customers in certain cases to validate some of our assumptions and the data. Is it that, is it that, look, we have our certain assumption, you'll walk to the customer and say, Hey, here's how we're thinking about the data. Is this on point? Yes, exactly. So you have to have an iterative uh, data validation process with the customer. In a small handful of the cases, we have done some degree of data labeling with the more, how should I say the crowdsource platform kind of solutions, which exist for data labeling. But the issue is specifically for the domains we are in that expertise to be able to label the data the right way may not <laughs> just exist, right? In the standard so, so let's, uh, mechanical let's, Turk environments. Yeah, I, I want to ask you about that because you got the mechanical Turk, right? You also have some more automated startups that, that have machine sure. learning themselves that are, that are labeling data. And then you have a small organization to look, we want to make sure that the people have contextual understanding. So what I would love to, to better understand is kind of, it kind of sounds like you guys use a little of everything, but if you could break let's down, back up, let's back up right there. Okay, I, 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 maybe it's, maybe your audience is aware, or maybe they're not, but when we use synthetic approaches, they're self-labeled, right? So instead of using a mechanical Turk or something to, you know, generate a bunch of variance Im images and then have somebody label those and then learn against that, you invert that, right? If you start with CAD and you render uh, a photorealistic image of something with lens flare and lens distortion and reflections and shadows and glare and all the stuff that happens in the real world, if you really understand how to simulate, then that data that you're simulating and where you add noise to it and sensor noise and all that stuff, uh, if you understand how to make a simulation of reality, simulation and synthetic training data are, are really one and the same thing. But your data, because you started with the model and you created right. an analog from it that is noisy and analog and, and messed up, uh, and then you train off that, it's already pre-labeled. So you don't need a mechanical Turk in these synthetic training systems. And in fact, there's a mm -hmm. yin and yang because a lot of simulation technologies, if you look at computational fluid dynamics or finite element analysis or ray tracing or any kind of simulation, 
usually simulation is extremely numerically intensive, it takes a long time to run a simulation. But most simulations, if you have something that's close to the answer, you can make them go much faster. They can converge to a simulation. So the neat thing is mm -hmm. if you take the output of your simulation and you put it on the input of a machine learning system, the machine learning system can start to predict what the answer to that simulation is going to be before you've run the simulation. Now, if you can initialize your simulation engine, your CFD, your FEA, your whatever simulator, if you can initialize its matrix with the prediction that came out of machine learning, now it's the actual time-consuming simulation is going to converge much faster because it's, it's starting 60% towards the answer. And so mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. allows you to train your machine learning system faster because now you're generating more examples more quickly which means the prediction gets better because you're giving it more variation, which means that your simulation goes better and you can, you can feed these suckers off of each other. So just like you have a GAN where you have two MLs you know, fighting each other, you can get a simulation engine and machine learning supporting each other in a, in a very nice circle. Yeah. And there are cases where we can't do simulation, in which case, whether it is uh, whether it is transfer learning approaches, whether it is using a combination of unsupervised learning to rank order things and then using human annotation, we have also uh, been looking at those things. But it's a combination. And many times for the classes of products that we have, we do have CAD information and hence that is so relevant to the kind of machine learning uh, applications we do. Yeah, absolutely. And super interesting thinking about simulations and how synthetic data differs from, you know, the other types of data that you, you would be collecting, processing. For non-synthetic data, right, these other types of data, I'm curious, when does it make sense for, for you all, what do you find it made sense to use more of an automated approach, or it makes sense to use, uh, have humans more involved that'll have more of a contextual understanding. Just curious about that high level and, and how you approach that decision-making process from a data, data labeling standpoint? Right, I, I think it depends on the stage of the product life cycle. In the earlier stages of product design, you are looking at different variations in the NPI phase, right? And in that phase, what you are doing is you are creating different options and you are checking for them. You don't really have a mature design. And at that point in time, what is important is to look at the images look at some outliers or anomalies in the set of images and have a pipeline which makes it easy for humans to label what are the outliers which can then at a later point in time feed your machine learning algorithm so i think it depends on the stage of the product you are in in the earlier stages it makes sense to have human inputs and annotation in the later stages if you have the cad files and you can simulate then you can actually use synthetic data a lot right in certain cases for, for simple tasks like let's say you don't have good quality images but human beings can deal with the variability in terms of edge detection and all that you may use a mechanical turk because people understand what the edge is irrespective of the context of what is it that we are trying to build yeah and i think there's a lot of other cases if you think of a, an assembly line building a server or a of smoke detector or whatever, there's all these different stages. And in a lot of cases, there's testing that happens at various stages, but there's certainly a lot of manufacturing measurements made. Like I said earlier, temperature and torques and pressures and, and you name it, there's a lot of data coming out of all of these process steps. But at the end of the line, there is a full functional test of the product. You test the smoke detector, you test the server, and you get a pass fail on that. And you can take that. And again, you don't need humans to label the data. There's the testing is self labeling. The real question is looking at all these other variables, but rain today outside, the humidity of the factory is 5% higher than it was yesterday. One of the things the system can learn is that the reflow oven temperature needs to go up by two degrees on humid days, and it needs to go down two degrees on dry days. So that's something that an expert would learn over a 30 year career, but machine learning through all the little micro variations of torques and pressures and temperatures, it can figure out this matrix in a way that, that humans don't. And that's especially important when you have lots of little projects that are, have much shorter runs. Right. And uh, one of the things I'll add to what Brian is saying is uh, the way we have built our modular hardware also is to have the ability 
to collect all this data out of the box. So this is not based on a request from a customer for a specific project, but having not just the data collection ability, but having an extensible data collection framework with a strong semantic data model to which we are mapping a lot of these mm -hmm. points, right? Which can then help doing the high dimensional correlation that Brian is talking about between the functional test and all the steps in the process uh, uh, across each product that is being assembled. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. One, one of the things I often think about is most folks who are going to be using the ultimate output of what AI has produced are non-technical. In my mind, that's going to be the same <laughs> if you're thinking about the manufacturing space. And so it's great. You have all of these different algorithms you can use. You have all this intelligence behind the system, but ultimately the most important thing is adoption. So I'm curious how you all think about adoption for non-technical folks. I think uh, we have focused on a few areas there, uh, which I mentioned before. One of the areas is around having a no-code environment for process development, right? So rather than having to work in a 30-year-old interface that many of the automation engineers do, can we actually provide a full-fledged system which supports all programming language constructs and is a, still a no-code environment where we can do all of this. The other part is understanding process. So if you understand manufacturing processes, rather than just saying, I have collected data on tens of thousands of dimensions and I have large number of rows, you figure out how you want to search it. We are using our process insights to create these templatized workflows, right? Which are mm -hmm. able to give those insights when, whenever, not, not only give monitoring capability, but insights into something is going wrong and what could be the causes of that thing going wrong and ensuring that all these insights and anomalies are tied into alerts and notification mechanisms so that you get the, uh, the gist of what is happening rather than you having to spend uh, days trying to figure out how to sift through all the data. So uh, yeah. workflows is a huge area of differentiation for us, whether it is in terms of how you code up, how it is integrated into a digital twin environment, to how we uh, debug when something goes wrong, and even the data from the debugging process being integrated with the simulation environment. So just making it much more visual, low-code, data-integrated yeah. approach is uh, how we are hoping we are going to get a lot better adoption. Yeah, it's all about making it easy. And my experience running big data centers, if you think of the kind of ML that was there for doing a security or log analysis or things like that, I didn't have to be an expert at machine learning to use these systems. If there was an outlier and somebody was trying to hack into your system, these things saw that there was an outlier and, and it alerted it to you, it showed you the data. Uh, there was the easy button and that's that's really what we're doing here. We have a system integrator arm of our company. So when we're following the 80-20 rule, you know, 80% of everything we do for our customers, we're trying to make it so they can self-serve so that it's it's super easy for them to, to service themselves and, and get the automation that they want just using our product as almost like consumer product. Mm -hmm. The 20% of it, we have our system integrator arm and they come in and they customize and do the things that are really particular to that customer specific process or product using a platform. So it's much easier for us to deploy that custom stuff. And then again, we can teach that customer how that custom part works. And again, put an easy button on it. And, and this kind of goes, goes back to what we were talking about before around having to customize historically having to customize everything and that kind of decreases your margins. But for you guys, you've done it, you've built your products in a way where, you know, to a certain extent, you can just hand it over, no code. But there's also this kind of small teaching element when, but when necessary, not necessary for every individual customer that you work with or product that you work on. That's right. And, and transference is, is really important. So we talked about looking at capacitor solder joints. If you do a naive implementation, it's going to learn how that capacitor solders onto that specific board for that specific smoke detector. If you do it right, that you can teach the system to learn how to find capacitor solder joints on any circuit board, no matter what the product is, right? And then now that you've trained the system up on what a good solder joint looks like, it can find it anywhere on any project. And it's the easy button. Interesting. So who, who are you generally 
when you kick off a conversation with a customer, who is it, who's the first person you're generally speaking with? And I also want to understand their level of knowledge of artificial intelligence and whether that's ultimately something that's really important to them in the conversation. Yeah, I think the first person we often try and target is uh, a plant manager. So somebody who already has a product, they already got factories, they're trying to bring new products online or they have products already online and they're, they're just not able to fill their factory with labor as for the mm. reasons that I gave before. They're, we have one customer that started on one line, they're up to six lines now, they keep expanding, their products taken off like crazy and they just can't get enough labor. And now they want to near shore it and they actually want to build it in three different continents. And so, mm. and they want to build it in high cost countries. So the only way they're going to do this is with automation. So again, we start with the plant manager. They're generally not machine learning experts, but they're very data driven. They care okay. very much about quality and they care very much about cost. And so they're very used to looking at reports on quality and, and cost. And so we can speak their language. We can give them the dashboards and all that stuff. And if you look at that uh, system that looked at the quality of solder joints, for example, they know that they have all sorts of automated systems for doing that, but they still have to have these human beings there hitting the okay button all day long because of the false positives. So the machine's doing 99.9% mm, yeah. of the work, but that 0.1% is enough to have an army of humans having to hit the okay button and they do it wrong all the time. So part of their quality problem, actually in a lot of electronics factories, 30% of all the employees are there to check the work of the other two thirds of the employees. <laughs> so, and they're so bored out of their mind that they get it wrong a lot of the time. So that's where they may not understand how it works, but it's very easy to communicate to a plant manager the numbers. Like this was your quality yield yeah. numbers you were getting before. And here's what you're getting now. And here's what your labor costs are. And now with our solution, the cost is the same, whether you're doing it in Germany, the US, China, Singapore, it doesn't matter what country you're doing it in, our cost is the same. Interesting, yeah. I never, I never uh, thought about that, just plant managers speaking in the same, false pod, all of these same terminologies you use in machine learning, right? They're also using in, in their business. So very easy to have that conversation. I'm sorry, Avi, go, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I'll give a slightly uh, different take on what Brian just said. There are OEMs who have their own manufacturing and they're the plant manager or the head of operations. Those are the guys who, would, who we would be talking to. But then you have OEMs who don't have their own manufacturing, who outsource their manufacturing to contract manufacturers. However, uh, some of these OEMs actually care about their brand, care about the quality of mm -hmm. the product, care about the customer experience. And especially some of the larger ones, what they would do is they would have internal automation teams who think about process automation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for their contract manufacturers. So they will be prescriptive saying that, hey, this part of the assembly process needs to be automated by you across all your global plants, right? So even that's a second audience uh, where the conversation we are having, because those guys are pretty data-driven. Some of them actually have some machine learning background, right? Because yeah. they are working at these large tech companies or large brands who can afford to hire those people. So there is a, there's that other set where th they want process standardization across contract manufacturers. They want a lot of data to come out of these automation systems so that they can design the next iteration of the product better. So between the head of operations at a plant level and these uh, internal automation teams who are focused on process optimization, those sets, our story resonates well with uh, both sets. Yeah, and that's a key point is that's our vision. If we think way off into the future, we're not doing it today, but where we're trying to get to is first step is how do we automate automation? How do we you know, deploy this stuff? Second step is once you've automated the deployment of, of automation systems and you're operating them now, you're building product using machine learning and insights to better run that production. But the third step, which again, getting back to the CAD background is how do we design the product better in the first place? How do we make the loop all the way back and take the learnings from every product you've ever made at your company? So if you're Logitech and you make mice, how do we take everything we've learned about plastics and uh, electronics and solder joints and everything and then bring that into the design of future products so that they have high quality right out of the box? And that's where things like machine learning can come in as well. I don't know if you know the concept of generative design, 
that this is a way where you can use simulation and machine learning to, instead of having humans do design, we, we usually think of the machine as, as testing a design and simulating a design, but if you can actually use machine learning and testing to explore different avenues of design, changing the almost infinite number of parameters that it takes to design a product, and then using simulations to test each of those different variations and find out what is a more optimal design than even what the human came up with. So that in that case, the human's goal is to define the requirements. Do I care about cost? Do I care about weight? Do I care about environmental impact? What do I care about? And the human is having the value judgments, the constraints, yep. and then the machine is trying to optimize within that framework. It's mathematical optimization, now applied <laughs> to design. I mean, not to ML, but to design, right? I mean, that's the whole concept, constraints and objective functions. Yeah, yeah, so this is super interesting because as we talk about these things and the way that you're adding value to, to your customers, right, to these manufacturing facilities, it really makes me think this is, it requires more of a consultative type of um, sale, right? Because you need to really get in there and understand exactly what they're doing. You guys have so many different, you know, ways that you can add value that you really need to understand the problem before you can really even speak to, hey, look, we think that we could drive X amount of, you know, ROI in, in your business. Yeah. Is that kind of on point or, or on track with how you guys approach that go to market? Absolutely. This isn't a B2C. This isn't a consumer sale. This is an enterprise uh, type sale. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, manufacturers typically have thin margins in uh, I wouldn't say <laughs> all cases, but in many cases, and hence ROI is first and foremost dimension that they care about, right? So all of this is great technology, but if it isn't ROI positive, I don't think they would care. Yeah. Yeah. And quality yeah. quality is, is huge uh, as well, because quality gets down to the ROI. Nobody wants scrap uh, parts. Some of these components are extremely expensive. You can catch it uh, early. And that's the other thing that's interesting about automating automation. When you bring in machine learning and computer vision and stuff, instead of inspecting at the end, you can inspect every step of the way. And as soon as there's a problem, sometimes you can recover from it. If you can't, you don't want to keep adding value to it. So that's, that's one angle of this. But then, of course, there's the end customer who cares about quality as well and the brand yeah. and, and their reputation. Yeah. Okay, guys, I want to be conscious of time. So just a, a couple more questions here. In the beginning, we, we, we talked about bringing in, you know, great talent, right, to help you to reach levels of innovation that potentially have not been tapped before. So for you... Brian would love to, to, to learn more about how you guys think about, right, just given that this market is competitive for folks who are kind of on the machine learning, data science side, how you think about recruiting top talent, maybe one or two keys that, that, have, been, that have worked for you. And then I would love to hear from Abhishek, what is it that drives, draws someone um, like yourself to an organization? and say, hey, look, I really want to be a part of this journey. Sure, it attracting talent, there's all the stuff that every company faces. You, uh, I think there's a lot that we do that's the same as everybody else. The thing that I focus a lot on and what makes us different, and there's a lot of people who are experts in machine learning that we want to attract that can go to any number of the big companies and they can get their one little thing that they're optimizing, finding pumpkins and photos or whatever. <laughs> and you can make a career out of that and make a lot of money or self-driving cars or what have you. There just aren't many companies that are going to expose you to the breadth that you would get here. Because we'll take all the technology of a self-driving car or photo recognition service or a classifier or whatever, but you uh, are gonna learn about how you move robots around and do visual servoing. You're gonna learn about CAD, you're gonna learn about computer graphics, uh, computer vision, how do you uh, see, how do you do work, work with multiple sensor types and integrate these different things together. If you think of an entire manufacturing line, big data, tremendous amount of data coming out of just one product, let alone mm -hmm. if you think of all the products that our customers are building and trying to put that in the cloud and really get uh, meta level insights across multiple companies. So you're, you're talking about simulation. And we talked about synthetics, generative design. I mean, where do you get to play with all these things? And the neat <laughs> yeah. thing is we have 
a couple of experts from every one of these fields. So you can talk to former CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. You can work with somebody who was world-class in computer vision and wrote all the seminal papers and built some of the consumer products in the VR space that we all play with. You can talk to people who are experts in the CAD world and so on. So that's the way I pitch it. And, yeah, and very interesting. Me, Sounds like just the incredible growth opportunity for folks who are, who are in that space and can uh, go off and learn from experts in whatever direction they see uh, as most exciting. Right. And, and to answer a question from my standpoint, Darius, firstly, is the market large enough? And manufacturing is one of the <laughs> impressive markets uh, among, amongst the sectors in the world. The second part is, and these, so one is factual, which is the market size, the potential. The other couple of uh, dimensions to evaluate are uh, more assumptions, right? Is there a technological inflection point? because of various reasons where problems which have not been addressed in this large space can actually be addressed today. And mm -hmm. my assumption was when it comes to, again, the advancements in cloud data storage, ability to process huge amounts of data, the algorithms which you can actually make sense of data in high dimension, both large N and large P, right? Plus the connectivity improvement with 5G, it will even get better, right? So. There is a bet you make on the foundational technologies act actually making it possible for you to address this larger market. And I think the last thing, which is probably the most important thing is the team. Can you work with these people, not just on problems, can you, not just on technical problems, but can you actually have interesting conversations with a set of people who are equally passionate about solving mm -hmm. the same set of problems that you want to? So for me, if it's, True for all of these, I think it's a no-brainer. You make the leap and you hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. Some interesting insights there, guys. Yeah, no, appreciate that. Last couple, these are these are more quick fire questions. The first question is, and we'll take them one at a time. First question is favorite tool to use inside of the, the organization. It doesn't have to be an AI tool, but whatever, whatever tool it is, uh, that's your favorite for productivity reasons or whatever. Slack. <laughs> Slack. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. There you Followed go. by Zoom. Slack, Zoom. Yeah. I thought that acquisition of Slack was pretty interesting. Um, the announcement of that. It always comes down to the people. So it's always the tools around people. And then for both of you, one person in AI or in business that inspires you or whose work you like to follow. For me, it's. Uh... Mike Jordan from Berkeley, I mean, not only I think he is, I mean, he's called the Michael Jordan of AI, but not only he's a <laughs> researcher, but also he's a very pragmatic guy and keeps it real while there is uh, so much hype, which many others try to uh, disseminate, propagate, whatever. I think in the beginning, when I was a kid, Steve Wozniak, if you look at his electronics designs, it, I don't think people appreciate it wasn't just the Apple II, but it was how much functionality he built into software instead of doing it in hardware. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I'd say in the current generation, some of what Elon Musk's crazy ideas, you know, some of them <laughs> actually work out. And I think just that line of being very creative in your thinking, rethinking old problems in new ways, I, I, I find that interesting. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. I can definitely see how that's playing out in, in, in Bright Machines. Some of those folks, their ideas that you speak to. Well, this was perfect, guys. I, I appreciate you taking out some time. I know we ran over, uh, but there was a ton of information that you guys were laying out, so I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> but, uh, but definitely appreciate you uh, taking some time out to chat, and I uh, hope to have you back on again uh, for, for an update. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sarge. All right. Thanks, guys.